What a wonderful haiku time I've had since the last podcast. I've had a long chat with Stanford M. Forrester, the editor of Bottle Rockets, of course, who's coming on the next podcast to join me for the workshop on Eugen. And then, of course, I got to talk with Brad Bennett again, as well as Joshua Gage and Kim Russell, who are making their debuts on the podcast as community judges. A big thank you to everyone who takes the time to chat to me about or on the podcast. It's a real joy for me. So welcome to Series 4, Episode 10 of the Haiku P Podcast. Today, it's all about euphony, the sound, the rhythm, and the musicality of your poetry. Of course, it was Brad Bennett who came along and gave us the workshop to introduce the topic. It's had great feedback, and even if you've missed submitting for this podcast, I really think it's worthwhile to go back and have a look at Brad's YouTube presentation. I will, of course, put the link in the show notes. A quick reminder that time is fast running out if you want to submit for the topic we're writing about at the moment. It's Kigo. You can write haiku with any seasonal reference you want, but the goal is to show myself and the other editors, Jim, Robert and Kristen, what season your poem takes place in. The deadline is the 20th of May, midnight Central European time. You know I'm strict. And please... Only via email. Now, as I was reading for the last podcast, episode 9, I came across something in Donald Keane's The Winter Sun Shines In. Yamamoto Kenkiki spoke of the sounds, the musicality, in this haiku by Shiki, which in this instance was translated by Donald Keane. Coxcomb, there must surely be Fourteen or fifteen stalks. Now I can't hear it myself, but let's not forget that he was talking about the original Japanese, and I can't comment about that, because of course I don't read or speak Japanese. But more importantly, he went on to say, anyone who argues exclusively on the meaning does not understand poetry. The sounds of your poem are important. So with that in mind, let's crack on with some previously published work. My thanks to the poets who sent me these pieces for inclusion in the podcast. If you feel that one of your previously published works fits the bill for an upcoming podcast, do please send it to me for consideration. As usual, poem first, poet second. I hope you enjoy it. Perfumed Notes The Unfurling of Soul Music Marilyn Ward Failed Haiku Issue 58 Wedding Bells A Cloud of Plum Petals Waltzing in the Air Natalia Kuznetsova From World Haiku Review April 2014 Haiku of Merit Smoothness of the sheet on my body. Mulberry blossom. Daniela Miso. From the Haiku Foundation's Haiku Dialogue, The Way of the Bedridden, July 15th, 2020. Bioluminescence. I skip a pebble across the universe. Debbie Strange. From Seashores 2, 2019. First place, Otherworldly Intergalactic Haiku Competition, 2019. And it was also shortlisted for the Touchstone Awards for individual poems in the same year. And now let's listen to some of your original haiku and senryu written especially for the podcast. As usual, we'll open with our first nomination for the judge's choice. I'm quite old-fashioned in many ways, so ladies first. Welcome to the podcast, Kim Russell. 
Thank you, Patricia. Pleasure to have you. And Kim is the first of our judges from the UK for a little while, and the first woman for a wee while too. Tell us, Kim, which poem have you chosen for your nomination and why? The following poem is my favourite. Night train, the owl's hoot softened. I'll read it again. Night train, the owl's hoot softened by Marilyn Ward. This poem caught my eye because it is a monocou, which could work in the three line format of a haiku, but it would lose its subtle ambiguity and other qualities which unfold one by one as the reader explores it. The single line suggests something sustained, like the journey of the train and the hoot of the owl. It has a steady rhythm, like that of a train, and can be read in one breath, although there is a natural pause after night train, separating the two sounds. The phrase night train sets the scene immediately, and of course owls hunt at night. In addition, night train, which suggests a whistle to me, and owl's hoot, are juxtaposed. The verb softened comes at the end of the monocou, putting emphasis on it, while creating a subtle ambiguity, which made me wonder which of them is softened. If it is the train, it is moving away from the observer, traveling into the distance, which must have some importance. Has the observer missed the train or decided not to get on board? Is someone important to them on the train? If it is the owl's hoot that is softened, then the owl is in the distance or flying away. Has it been hunting? Is it calling its mate? Whatever it is, both the whistling of a train and an owl's hoot are haunting sounds, suggesting sadness, wistfulness and nostalgia. Thanks, Kim. That was great. Thank you very much for doing that. Train horn sounds from afar, the blues, Lee Hudspeth. Train vendor, the click-click of the orange soda bottles, Minal Saroche. Midnight cycle, the gurgle and swish of insomnia, Marion Clark. Fine entwined vines, Lovers' fused fingers linger with the dawn. Robert Cathada Playing violin in front of the flutes. Chin rest chills. Jeff M. Pope Breathing exercises. Not enough to bring him back. B.A. France Hurdy Gurdy Man brings a conductor's passion to his life and music. Ian Speed. One line, two lines, triangle. Richard Downs. Waiting for the music of the pennies. Blind beggar. Avinda Kaur. Dancing to the clicking of her bracelets. Christine Wenk Harrison. Spooning by moonlight. Boombox for two. Doris Lynch. Shouldering the weight of the boombox. Good vibrations. Mark Farrar. Head unfolding from the swell in the pillow. A collapse of dreams. Alex Fife. Hips sway, keeping time in my ears. Giddy Nielsen Sweep. Avoiding work, itty bitty bubbles burst on the coffee surface. Ted Sherman 
Spring Sonata, Life Rhythm of Time, Great Symphony. Editor, Strezenkova. Bare feet squelching through mud, our first kiss. Robert Whitmer. Hard water cubes, tinkling crystal shake. Margarita. Wayne Kingston. Clatter, chatter, climbing up the metal ladder. Dorothy Mahoney. Faken bacon, spits and pops to make a cracking show. CX Turner. New tune, our blues, marry. Richard Sharma. Porch swing, the sway of a wayward daydream. Pat Davis. Wind in the reeds. The rustle of her wedding gown. Bill Fay. Forest campsite. In moonlight, the silk tents of caterpillars. Michael Dudley. Winter retreat. The bubbling kettle breaks the silence. Srinivas S. Let me interrupt the poetry for a minute and say a few thank yous. The first to Deborah P. Kalodji for helping me with suggestions for guests for the workshops. It was a big help. Thank you very much, Debbie. A massive thank you to James Young, Robert Horobin and Ted Sherman, who were the editors for submissions for this month. I can't tell you what a help it is to have the editing team working with me this year. And this month... For Kigo, James and Robert are back, with Kristen Lindquist, who's helping us too. If you'd like to join the editing team, even for one month, please do let me know. You'd be busy from the 1st to the 20th of every month, with three or four poems to read each day. If you're interested, send me an email, and that goes for community judging as well. I could always have more people on the team. A big thank you to everyone who helps me to keep the podcast available, free of charge, by buying me a coffee. It does go a long way to offsetting the cost of the podcast. And you know what, it's always a boost to know that people appreciate what you're doing. I know not everyone can afford it, but if you can donate the price of a coffee to the podcast, it would be very much appreciated. And you can do that by clicking on the Buy Me a Coffee button on the website. Last month, my thanks to Tony Williams, Dean Leavers, Jason Furtak, Linda L. Ludwig, Neera Kashup, Marcy Weasels, Wendy Gent, Kristen Lindquist, and Mimi Ahern. Thank you for your generosity. And now, back to the poetry. White noise, winter waterfalls in a freeze frame. Eugenius Zakarski A skeleton tree scratches at the shutters. Alison Douglas Turner Old grapefruit, one seed sprouts in the compost. David Oates David, I found one of last year's tomatoes sprouting in the compost. Keep your fingers crossed. They were great tomatoes. Winding path. I walk with the wind in the willows. Nina Singh. After a famine of flowers, finally the hellebore. Richard Tice. I was telling Richard that I was hoping to buy some hellebores for the garden because just as the snow starts to melt, my garden looks eh, a bit blah, and a hint of hellebore would be just the ticket. Unfortunately, I left it too late this year. Somebody remind me next year, please. The wind outside humming its doleful tune, 
uncaring full moon. Natalia Kuznetsova Sheen of oil on a spring puddle, liquid opal. Stephen Joseph Spring rain, the gentle falls of your footsteps. Jackie Chow Sudden shower, we whisper our dreams in the back seat of my car. Uma Anandalwa Whether rain or rainbow, weather vane. Mark Gilbert Spring snow, redbud blossoms swirl swiftly down the road. Steve Ullum Fat snowflakes slowly falling into spring. Pam Joy Ripe pumpkins. Deer tracks riddle the frost. Debbie Strange Late frost. All the new and lost lilacs. E.L. Blizzard Just sitting between the silhouette and shadow, this old oak tree. Richard L. Matter Spring blossoms, among them flutters a little boy's song. Samo Kreutz Terror in the trees, grackles buzzing small squirrel. Rabbit unfazed. Richard Bailey Lilies and smiles in a house of alleluias. Mike Blutenberger Dark harbour, waves lap portside rail of a rescue tug. Erin Castaldi Starry night, a lighthouse, a lighthouse. James Young The om sound ringing in each shell, call of the dawn. Lakshmi Aya Temple chants. Lit lamps dance on waves as the river turns. Near a Kashap. Lullaby. Slow waves slither across the sand. Paul Callas. Oh, Paul, what I wouldn't give to see the sea right about now. A rambling brook rushes through the gap, babbling on and on. Pat Gear Joshua, welcome to the podcast. Joshua is our second debutee this week. It's always lovely to have a new voice or two, isn't it? Now, Joshua... You were wondering how the judging would work. And I have to say, I loved your suggestion that we do virtual cage fighting or the idea that you had to make a meal and get screamed at by Gordon Ramsay. But I'm really sorry to disappoint you. If we can't, the three of us can't agree, or the three of you can't agree on a poem at the end, we'll dis- decide the results by a quiz. Appropriately, the quiz will be on a tea ceremony, but not a Japanese one a British one. And I may have to scream at you if your answers are disappointing. But for now, please tell us who is your nomination for the judge's choice and why? I picked Deborah Peep Kologi's Moonless Night, An Owl Flies Low Over the Highway. Moonless Night, An Owl Flies Low Over the Highway. Sejiki discussed the owl as a winter kigo. Days grow short in winter and nights grow long. So humans often find themselves interacting more with these graceful nocturnal creatures. If anyone has witnessed an owl in flight, 
there is a sense of soundless elegance in the moments of these predators. So I was immediately drawn to the moment in Deborah P. Kologi's haiku. The euphony is rich here. The long O sounds in moon, owl, low, and over really draw out this poem and echo against each other. The liquid L sounds in moonless, owl, flies, and low serve to soften the poem too. In fact, there is only one hard plosive sound in the entire piece, the, the T in night. The rest of the phonemes in this poem are soft and, and luxurious and really serve to emphasize the quiet of the moment. What's also interesting are the choices Kologi could have made but didn't. For example, line one could easily have been new moon, but she, go, she chose to go with moonless night instead. I think this is because, as Brad discussed in his lecture, poets need to find a balance of too much euphony and not enough euphony. New Moon would have added an extra long O sound, which might have been too much in a short piece. Also, Kologi chose flies low instead of the obvious swoops, which also spaces out the assonance and works to incorporate those liquids to add euphony to the poem. I also enjoy the metrical balance between the three lines. Each line is a variation on Dimeter, two stress syllables or feet per line, but none of them have the exact same meter. This creates a euphonic balance in terms of rhythm, but also keeps the poem from becoming too sing-song, especially in minimalist structure like haiku. Deborah P. Kologi has taken a really powerful moment of a natural predator and captured it quite succinctly in a euphonic haiku. Joshua, thank you very much for that. It was a, a, a great commentary. It's gonna make it so hard if I do actually have to use my executive, executive powers to, to decide which one wins. Grilling sun, screeching seagulls squabble over my lunch. Sherry Grant Twilight deepens. Starlings on a wire swirl suddenly. Kathleen Tice Tinted spring and the spinach green of goose shit. Craig Kittner Scytherism Blue finches fluffing in spring rain. Christina Chin. I hope I said that word right. I suspect not. But it makes a great sound, doesn't it? Thanks, Christina. Perhaps this is a good time to remind you to go and read the poems on the show notes, and then you can look up the word yourself and have a go at pronouncing it. Hawk screech, the tight wheeze. Of these lungs. David Kowicki Air. Morning dove coos soothe the restlessness stirred by dawn. Douglas J. Lanzo. This bird song, a multitude of species thronging. Kim Russell. Lamppost lit, rustling of dry leaves. In the alley. Daniela Miso. Dinner outdoors. Cicadas cheap in unison. Krista Pandy. Perception. A rare hare leaps into a dashing dog. Dorothy Burrows. Desert waterhole. In furious frequency, frenzied flies buzz. Rob McKinnon. Rob, that's a real tongue twister. Thank you very much. Firefly, stay lit a little longer on the tip of my finger. Ronald K. Craig. Flower to flower, the soft hum of honeybees on a summer's day. Tracy Davidson. Gossamer wings fanning the flowers. Blue dragonfly. Linda L. Ludwig. 
summer heat, the shimmer of sweat on his brow. Bona M. Santos Summer school students on a quest to catch up. Yellow school bus. Eve Castle My cat laps the lawn. Spring thaw. Kristen Lindquist Winter rain, a cat's soft purr by the window pane. Nisha Ravi Prasad Wind turbines blocking the view of the sky and the coyote's song. Angela Terry Grey feathers of ash float and dance towards the picnic. Dale Bennett And now there's just one poem left. Who will it be? Well, I guess one of you knows by now which one it is. Or do you? To tell us which of the poems is the final nomination for the judge's choice, let's meet Brad Bennett again. Welcome back to the podcast, Brad. Thank you. It's great to be here. Lovely to have you, as always. And I should let you know that your workshop received a lot of positive feedback. So thank you very much for, for adding to what is a growing library of educational workshops on the site. So Brad, put us out of our misery. Which of the poems did you choose? I chose a poem by P.H. Fisher. First light, the fairy gunwales gleam with fresh white paint. First light, the fairy gunwales gleam with fresh white paint. My first response to a haiku is always about the haiku moment. And this poem paints a wonderfully vivid picture of dawn light catching the fresh white paint of the ferry boat, the gleam of a new day. The ferry waits to carry the first group of passengers across the stretch of that day, perhaps across the stretch of a bay. This poem is rife with fresh starts. It feels right. My second response to a haiku is often about its juxtaposition. In this poem, the phrase in the second and third lines is well observed and well constructed. The fragment is simply and sharply rendered and helps to create effective ambiguity. The light can refer to sunlight or to the gleam of the paint on the ship. Overall, the juxtaposition is successful. If a haiku feels right to me, like this one does, it usually means that it also sounds right. So I start examining the euphony in the poem. This haiku is knitted together with several musical threads. We hear the alliteration of hard G sounds and gunwales and gleam. We hear the alliteration of the F sounds in first, fairy, and fresh which are effectively and subtly spread out among all three lines. If they were back to back to back, it would probably feel too heavy handed. We also notice the consonants in the T sounds at the ends of first white and paint. Finally, we appreciate the internal rhyme of light in the first line with white in the third. None of these effects feel in your face or over the top. I believe they all help to unify the poem musically. Well done, P.H. Fisher. Thanks so much, Brad. It's, it's so difficult. I come into this whole judges nomination conversation with a poem in my head that I think is going to be the, the outright winner. And then I listen to my three judges explain their, their poems, their choices, I think, oh, I really hope they make up their own minds because <laughs> I, I'm really, I'm really torn now. But anyway, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Joshua and Kim. Great commentaries from you all. So now we're going to discuss which of the nominations should be the judge's choice and which the honourable mentions.
Thank you, Brad, and thank you too to Kim and Joshua for such interesting and informative nominations. You'll have to get the Summer Journal to find out which of the three nominations was the judge's choice and which were the honourable mentions. Well, now that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed the poetry and the commentary. One last reminder that we're currently writing with Kigo. Send your haiku with any seasonal reference that takes your fancy by email. And remember, the deadline is the 20th of May. I'll see you back here in a couple of weeks for our next podcast, when we'll be having a chat, if all goes well, with Stanford M. Forrester. Until then, keep writing. If I made any mistakes, left something out, or you'd like more information about something, just send me an email. Ciao!